Um, but I want to turn now to Yahoo Finance's Julia LaRoche for a conversation with the CEO of Rubini Macro Associates, Noriel Rubini. Julia? Thank you so much, Kristen. And Noriel Rubini, always great to have you back on the program. Uh, I want to start with what's been happening in the cryptocurrency markets, particularly Bitcoin, uh, falling below 30,000 for the first time since January um, on Tuesday here, and certainly well below its peak of more than 63,000 just back in April. A lot's been going on in this space. You've been pretty vocal in the area. What do you make of what's transpired lately? Well, that volatility is based on the fact that these uh, cryptocurrencies are not really currencies. They don't have any fundamental value. They're driven by speculation, by FOMO. And yes, uh, Bitcoin almost reached 64,000 in April, and now it's done uh, more than 50%. And uh, there are days in which it falls overnight, uh, 10, 20, even 30%, uh, based on no fundamentals. And then you have other things like uh, Dogecoin was created as a joke, as a parody of cryptocurrencies and shit coins, and it went through the roof and now is collapsing. So this is a place where calling them currencies is a misnomer. They're not a unit of account. They're not a scalable means of payment. They're not a stable store of value. They're not a single numerator. Calling them cryptocurrency is really a joke because they're not used as a means of payment. So, and they're not even assets. They don't have income, they don't have use. They don't have utility. They're not a stable store of value. So they're not currency. They're not assets. They're just a speculative bubble that is now bursting as the regulators are cracking down and they're going to crack down more. So safe to say you don't see a future when it comes to cryptocurrency. There's nothing that might change your thesis? Uh, nothing. If anything, the future is that uh, most central banks over time are going to introduce central bank uh, digital currencies. Uh, electronic euro, dollar, RMB, you name it. But uh, that's not a victory for crypto because these uh, central bank digital currencies are not going to be based on crypto nor on blockchain. They're going to be centralized. They're going to be in a system that is uh, private, that is monitored, that is permission, and so on. So they have nothing to do with crypto, but they're going to have the advantage that compared to any cryptocurrency, but also relative to other private uh, payment system. They're going to be instantaneous, settling, clearing. They're going to be costless. They're going to be safe. And therefore, if and when they're going to be introduced, they're going to dominate not only cryptocurrencies that are no means of payment, but eventually could be also a threat to other traditional things like uh, bank accounts or even some of the digital payment system like uh, Alipay, WeChat Pay, Venmo, PayPal, and so on. So the future of money is central bank digital currencies, certainly not... Uh, cryptocurrencies. Let's talk about um, some of the things happening here in the U.S., some of the conversations, particularly around uh, inflation, kind of this debate of is this going to be transitory or more rampant? We also had uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell make some comments on the issue. It seems here that he thinks inflation will subside, but he doesn't know exactly when that will happen. Where do you stand on this issue and what kind of risk does it pose? Well, I'm on the side of those who believe that the rise in inflation is not going to be temporary. It's going to be more persistent. We have a massive monetary and fiscal stimulus, uh, much bigger and more protracted than we had after the global financial crisis. We have a bunch of supply bottlenecks. We have pent up demand because there is at least $2 trillion are for savings. There are constraints to the labor supply. There's been a sharp increase in commodity prices, in home prices. Uh, in food prices, uh, earning calls suggest that many firms are seeing rising cost of their inputs. Many leading firms and corporations are increasing wages 10% or more because they cannot find workers, Amazon, Chipotle, McDonald's. Uh, there's a bottleneck in the supply of semiconductors is leading to um, factories of new cars uh, being shut down. And that's why also used car prices are spiking. Inflation expectations are rising. The dollar is weakening, and that implies imported inflation and higher dollar price of commodities. And the Fed wants to overshoot 2% with the risk of the anchoring inflation expectation. And our policies are becoming, maybe rightly so, pro-labor, pro-workers, pro-unions, because there's been such a massive increase in income and wealth inequality that uh, the $1.9 trillion of the Biden stimulus is all going rightly so to workers, unions, to unemployed workers, to partial employed workers 
to people who have been left behind. So uh, we're going to end up in, with high inflation and a wage, uh, wage uh, uh, price spiral over time. And the Fed uh, cannot tighten because there is so much debt in the system that if they're going to try to tighten too soon, uh, the system is going to crash. So they are in a debt trap. They're in a fiscal dominance. Mm-hmm. I, I want to bring up something with you. Our, our colleague Rick Newman had a, he has a great column that just came out moments ago, and I know we're waiting for the official GDP numbers, but it seems you know the recoveries happened here in the U.S. Yet, as you were kind of talking earlier about labor, we haven't seen uh, employment come close. We still have fewer than 7.6 million fewer workers than we did before. Yet, we have this recovery here in the U.S. So, how do you kind of think about that? If our economy is kind of recovered, but we still don't have folks coming back into the workforce or companies needing to fill these vacancies. What do you make of the consequences there? Can we just kind of operate with fewer folks in the workplace? Well, uh, by the end of the year, the output gap is going to disappear. Output is going to be back to potential, while the unemployment rate is still above what people refer to as Nairo. But I think there are going to be a significant number of supply bottlenecks uh, on the labor supply that are gonna put the upward pressure on wages. We still have ongoing uh, unemployment benefits that are continue for a while. Uh, we have lack of childcare. And, you know, and even if a school were to reopen, this is a fundamental problem. Unless uh, it's resolved, it's gonna limit the ability of women and care providers to rejoin the labor force. Many people prefer to work from home. They don't want to go back to lousy jobs that imply long commutes. And the disruption of occurred implied that the new jobs of the future are not uh, where they used to be, but people cannot very as much move as in the past. So I think there'll be a whole bunch of friction in the labor market that imply that while output is at potential, unemployment is going to remain high, but probably the structural unemployment rate is going to be higher. And rightly so, our fiscal policy are going to protect workers. We're going to give them more transfer payments, more insurance of one sort or another. And therefore, people are going to say, I'm not going to have a lousy hamburger flipping job that doesn't pay anything. It doesn't give me any benefit. It's a gig economy. I'm going to have transfer payments and other benefits coming from the government. And I'm not going to rejoin the labor force until things change. And that's going to put upper pressure on wages. You know, the federal minimum wage is already $15. That implies that then all federal contractors have to pay 15 But now, a um, not growing number of corporations are saying to get workers and keep them and retain them, we have to pay them $15 per hour at the minimum, probably much more than that. So I think that there'll be upward pressure on wages that are going to imply this wage price spiral over time. It's going to lead to higher inflation over time. But do you, do you think we'll see a 1970s style inflation event here or is that just uh, too out there? Well, you know, in the 1970s, what happened was not only that we had inflation high, double digits, but we had stagflation, inflation and uh, recession, because there were two negative supply shocks. The old shock of 73, Yom Kippur War, and 79, Iranian Revolution, that implied that uh, output fell, potential, and the cost went up with the price of oil spiking. This time around, I think there'll be other negative supply shock that uh, are going to hit the economy, reduce potential growth, increase the cost of production, and like in the 70s, with loose monetary and fiscal policy, we're going to lead to stagflation, high inflation, and also recession. If you think about these new supply shocks, what they could be, a deglobalization, protectionism, and inward-oriented policy, restrict trade in goods and services, aging of population in advanced economies and emerging markets. You know, 30 years ago, China joined the global labor supply, kept a lead on wages. Now there is aging in China in Russia, in Korea, in East Asia, and of course in US, Europe, Japan, advanced economies. There'll be decoupling between US and China on trade, on technology. This all is gonna also disrupt uh, global supply chains. The restriction to migration that kept the lead on wages, uh, migration from south to north, from emerging market, US and Europe is gonna be restricted for political reason. Global climate change is gonna also be a negative supply shock. It's gonna imply drought, Look what's happening in the west of the US, in California. There is not water. One third of our vegetables, two thirds of our fruits and nuts come from there. And that's going to be a shock to food prices, not just in the Middle East, not just in Sub Saharan Africa, even in the west of the United States. Um, we're going to see balkanization of global supply chains 
uh, and reshoring of manufacturing from low-cost China to US and Europe. We're gonna see global pandemics implying that uh, you want to have policies of national self-reliance for key goods and services, pharma product, agriculture, PPE, rare earths, and so on. There'll be this backlash against income and wealth inequality is gonna make to fiscal policy labor stronger. And finally, we have cyber attacks that are disrupting production. One day is a colonial pipeline, another day is a beef processor. Every day there is another one that disrupts production, or if firms have to then try to prevent those things, they have to spend hundreds of billions of dollars to upgrade their IT system. That's another huge cost. So you have nine factors that are all reducing potential output, increasing the cost of production and the price of goods and services. And with easy monetary fiscal policy, we're going to end up with stagflation like the 70s over time. Well, certainly some uh, profound social and political implications, as you were highlighting. Anori Rubini, professor of economics at NYU's Stern School of Business and chairman of Rubini Macro Associates, I thank you so much for joining me today.